Thank you for joining us after a cold spell. <laughs> um, my name is Ashley Farrow Murray, and I'm the curator of theater and dance here at MPAC. And I also help curate a talk series at MPAC. And I'm here with Thomas de yes. France, um, <laughs> who is, yeah, uh, round of applause, uh, round of applause. <laughs> Um, Tommy is, I'm going to do a really informal Great. introduction of Tommy tonight Great. and actually talk a little bit more about how we're here yeah. and what we're going to do tonight. Um, because Tommy is, really needs no introduction within a field, especially of dance. And oftentimes our talk series is touching a little bit more on subjects that are uh, maybe more immediately removed from the actual artistic practice that's happening concurrently in the building. Uh, whereas tonight, Tommy finds himself here at MPAC um, in conjunction with Jumatatu Poe and Germain Dante Beecham's um, Let Them Move You series and residency, which is going on right now, and we'll have a work in progress showing on Thursday. Um, so we might get in a little bit yeah. more into kind of what Tommy's been doing with them in a bit of a collaborative advisory sure. process, if that's fair to say. Um, but, but then also Tommy has this uh, extremely well-established presence in the dance studies community as a scholar. Um, he's on the faculty at Duke University where he serves both in the Department of African American Studies as well as the dance department. Um, has a history with MIT Media Lab and has also been making his own work in laboratory spaces with dance and interactive technology and media, which he'll get into a bit tonight. Mm -hmm. Um, and has uh, been co-editor on several edited collections, as well as published his own monograph uh, research book on, um, oh my God, Alvin thank you, <laughs> <It's all right. laughs> on Alvin it's Ailey, right. um, <clears throat> and, and is just kind of like the, the force in a uh, conversation around critical race, critical black studies, technology, dance, where those fields are intersecting, where they've diverged, um, and how they're evolving, which is really what we're going to talk a lot okay. about tonight. Yeah. Um, so Tommy's going to give a talk, but we decided over lunch to switch things up mm -hmm. tonight. <laughs> um, and after Tommy talks for about a half an hour, we're actually going to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. And um, Tommy and I have been talking informally and not at length at all just various little moments yeah. in different encounters over the years about some big questions that I have about our field and where it's going um, and how Tommy's research and work is fitting into that. Uh, so we thought that we would just really like get into that tonight and, and hash it out with you all and hopefully we can open the conversation as well. So without further ado, I'd like to warmly introduce Tommy de France. Dear mentor and scholar, <laughs> who had to wake up at 5.15 in the morning to get here because his flight from Philly was canceled, which many of us can relate to. So especially so thankful standing. for that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, thanks so much. And thanks to the folks here making the room hum and flow. When I came into this space, I thought it was too dark because it was so um, dry. So I needed some sound to help animate me into the presence of the room and the work we want to do together in the talk. Um, thanks so much, Ashley, and thanks Juma and Dante and crew for us all being here together to give us a chance to work through some of these questions. Um, we decided to go a little casual, so I have some things I do want to share that are quite particular, but I'm also going to talk a bit, and I will watch the time. I'm going to try to keep it within 20, 25 minutes so we can have this conversation and open things out in a, in a different way and see where they want to go. The proposition that we have to work with is here in this title, this question of um, improvising the interface, which maybe is the space of dance technologies in some way or some dance technologies, um, but also this question of how the new black dance studies are implicated and expanding the address of the possibility of dance technology outward. And this has been something I've been concerned with in my own lab that I um, operate down at Duke University. Um, I run a lab called Slippage, Performance, Culture, and Technology. This is our old space. We now have a, a new space in a shiny new building at Duke. 
um, that the Let Him Move You company has been in residence twice there, um, which is a great you know, pridefulness for us in the slippage lab. But we work on um, interface designs and create performances and also do um, sort of activism work in terms of dance studies, in terms of pushing questions of curating for communities of color, um, established, we've established a collegium on African diaspora dance that has a biannual meeting that 250 people come to where we're asking these questions about how uh, black performance and black dance, which you know we assume is a thing that we can identify in some ways, um, how these, uh, these modes of, of research and performance are opening out towards audiences and reflecting back and expanding possibilities. Um, in the lab, we, we work with uh, consumer technologies, but also things that are designed explicitly for the lab. As you were entering, you were hearing some sounds generated by um, Karan Karim, who's been in the lab for the last two years. He's a graduate student at Duke, and those sounds are generated by something he's devised called a synth ball, which we use for some performances. Um, so the sounds are actually generated through a device that we created to work on a piece about white privilege. Something that happens in the lab is that we're imagining interface design as being a way to open ourselves to questions of, of course, identity, but politics writ large. We're consulting theoretical writings as well inside the lab to better understand ideologies that circulate in our performance projects. And for the researchers in the lab, we think of engaging with theory as an embodied practice. And in time, the writings that we look at together become foundational concepts for the development of research into performance. In addition to helping us understand how social relations have been made manifest, um, some concepts bubble up, like you know, concepts from psychoanalysis, of uh, cultural memory, physical empathy, and social subjection offer points of entry to the organization of energy in space and time. We take it for granted that the continual interplay between theoretical writing and work in the studio enlivens dance, as well as the process of devising performances and interfaces. So to tilt towards the new black dance studies, if the technology part seems maybe coherent in a way, there's a laboratory. We have machines, we do coding, we develop stuff, develop devices and interfaces. And maybe we can talk for a moment about the, this idea of a new black dance studies. And I wanna turn to the work of Christina Sharp to pivot us in this direction. Uh, she's a researcher based at Rutgers University and she's written an amazing short text a couple of years ago called In the Wake on Blackness and Being. And this text discusses the afterlives of slavery. It really opens this concept out towards um, a larger understanding. And the idea of the afterlives of slavery is something that Cydia Hartman and maybe um, Frank Wilderson um, have really developed in the process of this articulation of Afro-pessimism. The idea that black life, like queer life, has no future because it has to operate within a short past. The past is foreshortened because it's unknowable. These 21andMe ads in Ancestry.com that proposed that we could somehow trace our roots for black Americans especially stop very suddenly and emphatically with no resolution possible. Christina Sharp writes about this idea in her formation of the afterlives of slavery, um, and she's thinking about the work of being black as wake work, or work that happens in the wake of the slave ships that cross the Atlantic in the Middle Passage. The wake is, you know, double entendre, because of course the wake is the gesture, the ritual gesture that happens after the death of the body. So in the space of the wake, we find for Christina Sharp, the possibility of black life circumscribed by the afterlives of slavery. So the new black dance studies in a way is research that conceives itself entirely implicated in the formation of black life, but it's 
against the idea that there is a unified black subject. In the new black dance studies, we dance to demonstrate our protest to the assumption of a unified subject. We will not be one thing. We will not just be black, as though that's one thing. We won't be queer, as though that's one thing. We won't be male or female, as though that's one thing. We won't be middle class, bourgeois, Jack and Jill, as though that's one thing. We'll be many things simultaneously in this paradigm of the new black dance studies. And um, working with performance curator Tara Aisha Willis, who works in Chicago, um, I was able to co-author a text about this proposition, and I want to just read a little bit of that. We wrote, black moves that emerge under the umbrella paradigm of an African diaspora become dance that resists category and restores faith. We call this black dance to underscore its commonalities and diversity, common in terms of the everyday ubiquity of many forms of physical expression among black people and in circumstances rendered black by social circumstance and experience. Diverse in the range of activity that extends multidirectionally towards museums, church sanctuaries, street festivals, basketball courts, college classrooms, dance studios, and literary archives. We claim black moves as we claim black lives, urgent, meaning-filled, seemingly impossible, conflicted and sanctified, queer, immigrant, and embodied processes of engaged intellect. So in this paradigm of the, the new black dance studies, one slippage project that I want to share with you is a, an exploration of um, works by Kara Walker, um, her Civil War series. We got a commission from the National Museum of Art to create a performance in response to Walker's work. And so we were working with the idea of silhouette and inter well, we we're designing an interface to work with this idea of silhouette and this kind of shadow that sits behind the thing that you can see. Walker's work, if it does anything, is it brings forward, um, it brings forward the idea of black life as being uh, the ultimate background noise for anything that's American and in some ways that's global, that black American life in the afterlives of slavery becomes the, the static in the system, if you will, that, that you can't help hearing, but often might try to resist. Um, so we, uh, in looking at Walker's work, uh, were curious about how to design something that suggested these sorts of hauntings, but also allowed these um, sort of uh, a silhouette forms that Walker works with um, to, to become uh, lively and animated by the dancers. We were also curious about this concept of lyrical surplus that Fred Moten, who's a performance theorist based in New York, offers us. And Fred writes, this is something Fred Moten wrote, see, black performance has always been the ongoing improvisation of a kind of lyricism of the surplus. Invagination, rupture, collision, augmentation. This surplus lyricism is what a lot of people are after when they invoke the art and culture of and for my people. Blurred, dying life, liberatory, improvisatory, damaged love, freedom drive. So in a way, um, I was thinking about how Moten suggests that a resistance to being an object a certain sort of freedom drive is at the heart of black performance. And this concept is something that in the Slippage Lab we're constantly contending with. You know, what's the purpose of these sort of explorations through technology? And in a way, I think we always come back to this idea that we're animating a freedom drive even as we're exploring something that might be about a certain kind of surplus. And again, this is what Moten offers us is that in the um, sort of surplus lyricism, he calls it a surplus lyricism, so you get both the, the surplus but also the lyrical inside of that. Um, we get a, a too muchness that replenishes through its animation. This is how he's defining improvisation in jazz and how he gets to a way to think about what the ensemble does to create the possibility of a, a vibrant black life. 
So I want to share a little bit of video from this piece with you now, um, thinking of these concepts that we were working with in the slippage lab. Uh, this performer is Brittany Williams, and um, she's joined in just a moment by um, an artist named Shireen Dixon.
Hershini Vanna Young, who is a theorist of performance, black studies and capitalism at the University of Texas writes, performance can never be entirely new or entirely volitional as all performance repeats prior non-original substitutions, even if those substitutions are invisible, forgotten, buried or ignored. She writes, to be black is to have accrued a subjectivity haunted by the spectral traces of a social, political, and ideological history. So in her provocative study of an African diaspora that is always already bound up with gender, a performance theorist Sershini Bonnie Young wonders at the historical injury and collective wounding wrought by slavery and colonialism. She works to delineate a diaspora that is what she calls much more than global patterns of flows and resistances or even systems of cultural exchanges to consider one that might be embedded in the dense structures of memory. This memory includes the hauntings of violence done not only to individuals but also to groups of subjected, subjugated black people who have been cast as the ghosts of modernity, the indispensable coerced mechanisms of labor, the other against whom the whiteness of the imperial, imperial subject was formed. So somehow around 2005, um, Slippage uh, was concerned with thinking about how environments hold history and, and especially how particular locations tell their own tales of human trauma and survival. So Hershini Vani Young's um, book, which is Haunting Capital, Memory Text in the Black Diasporic Body, uh, it offered us a framework for thinking about the complex ways in which trauma and violence circulate across geographies. So we had already been exploring the text of um, Jean Toomer's Kane, which is a, a, an experimental novel from the Harlem Renaissance. It was first published in 1923. It's quite well respected and quite um, distributed, especially in academic circulation. So, you know, lots of English students will read this text and black studies students will probably um, have familiarity with this text. And we had been thinking about what to do with this text or how to approach it. And Bonnie Young just helped give us a kind of push into thinking through how to um, imagine uh, this work outward somehow. So Toomer's text um, inspired an exploration of the lives of men and women circumscribed by violence uh, as African Americans living in the South during the height of sharecropping. And in Kane, we, we uh, came up with an interface that um, helped us tell this story and try to think about what a, an electronic cane field might look like or feel like, and then how the dancing that happened in the space of this cane field could um, both um, kind of embody and, and, and enable uh, these relationships, the telling of these stories, but also maybe uh, offer some sort of uh, affirmation of survival and perseverance through the dancing itself. Um, this piece, we'll just look at a little bit of it from the beginning of Kane. And um, yeah, this is in collaboration with Weidman Davis Dance. Uh, Weidman Davis Dance based in South Carolina. Tanya Weidman Davis and Thaddeus Davis are the directors of that company. And we'll look at just the first uh, three or four minutes of this work. Oh, yeah, thank you.
psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan wondered at the way in which time might be situated in experience that extends beyond calculations of rhythmic meter. So Lacan is um, kind of standard reading for people interested in certain branches of philosophy and psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic theory. Um, he's useful in performance studies for people who are concerned with how we, how one grows into being one. And that's you know, a, a kind of really broad stroke way to think about Lacan. But I was most interested in his uh, descriptions of logical time because there's a way that um, queer theory and queer studies have always been curious about queer time, um, but black people have, uh, you know, we, we for a long time have experienced and lived in something we call color people's time, which is uh, a rendering of time that always imagines a kind of beforeness as being inevitable. So there's a memory of a thing that can't be known, but then that means there's always a late, there's an always lateness to the, the circumstance of black life. And color people time is a kind of ironic depiction of how um, there's a possibility of a certain kind of resistance by maintaining a different clock than the capitalist clock that re would require black people to produce labor, to produce capital. So Lacan is super interesting as we're thinking about this question of new black dance studies um, because he has this idea about logical time that explores how it is we understand performance to operate. And the we in that formation is a kind of Euro, a European sort of um, thinking about how people who are uh, rooted and in, in, in sort of um, grow up inside European aesthetics receive dance technology interfaces. This was my interest in it. So um, he, like Suzanne Langer, the philosopher who worked on aesthetic theory, um, was concerned with the, the actual intuitive neurobiological seeing stage. So they are both saying, Lacan and Langer are saying something similar. They're saying, first we see the thing, and then there's this open space of understanding, which leads to the interpretation and concluding, which is also like a fixing and a shutting down the, the idea of what the performance did. So Langer and Lacan are both curious, again, this, it's a three-part kind of system they develop, where first we see it, and that just happens through our bodies, in a way. Um, then we try to make sense of it. And then we kind of decide what we think it means. And you know, then we understand the thing in some way. So this idea of appliant understanding phase, the middle part that could be extended and stretched, um, this helped us think about ritual performance in black culture. There are you know, many dance rituals that might extend, um, especially in the spaces of the Black Caribbean, you know, for hours or days, um, and these spaces where time is reconfigured. And this idea of reconfiguring time is in some ways at the basis of black performance, which is typically concerned with rendering rhythm. How is rhythm being manipulated? This is how the dance takes shape. Um, or the performance takes shape through the rendering of the manipulation of rhythm. So the lag, there's a way that um, dance interfaces are always producing a certain kind of lag because the time, the biological time, when we see the gesture or the thing happen, there's a lag as the interface does its rendering and its algorithmic work before that, that gesture is realized in its other form. So we've always been in Slippage Lab concerned with this lag and this kind of latency and curious about it and how to, how to, um, how to manipulate that latency in, in some kind of way that's that productive and useful. We um, are also finally super interested in empathy and dance theorist Susan Foster who teaches at the University of California, Los Angeles, she writes, to choreograph empathy entails the construction and cultivation of a specific physicality whose kinesthetic experience guides our perception of and connection to what another is feeling. And she wonders in her book, Choreographic Empathy, she wonders, are there techniques of knowledge production that invite us to imagine the other without presuming knowledge of the other? And this sort of exploration of how bodies feel and how they feel about each other was super useful to us as we were um, trying to align a, a question of an interface with a connect and a kind of um, blink moment when we decide we think we know things about someone when we see them. 
And we were curious about that moment and this idea of uh, kind of literal labels that get attached to a person in terms of an identity politic and how those could be undone or stretched open and reformed. And uh, we made a, uh, an interface for a piece called The Weight of Ideas that I'd like to share with you as the final thing we'll do before our conversation.
Um, so I think we'll chat for like 15 or so minutes and then open it up um, because I actually, I think that there's a lot there and we were talking earlier today about some like big looming questions, um, but I, I wonder if actually the content of your talk even addressed and answered some of them. So I might pose them for you and for us um, and then we can just dive in and go from there because my big, <laughs> my big hang up these days um, and what we've really been talking about has been this question of the relationship between dance and technology and how it's really changed over the last 10 years um, and how, just as like a brief introduction here, um, much of the work that was happening maybe 10 years ago and as some of this work was beginning to develop was really focused and centered around a lab. Um, dancers going into a lab and um, exploring kind of basic what I've been talking about today as like one-to-one -one interaction, right? I move my hand and something happens um, and, and kind of wondering, you know, noticing that we are moving away from that as a field and thinking a lot about um, kind of complexifying the relationships between the body and media from those beginnings and then wondering um, whether or not there's still room in the field for that kind of engagement and and why and where and how and all of that. So I don't know if you wanna start there as someone who is still really very much working in the lab, but also trying maybe to complexify it in those ways. Yeah, that's, you know, it's it's such a complicated question. You've asked me this like for the last two years. Every year it's like, well, what, you know, what happened and where did that stuff go? and. You know, I keep trying to take it back. So when we think of dance technology as a sort of discrete realm, you know, maybe we, we want to sort of start with Loie Fuller, or not start, but think about her. And, you know, she wasn't really making lighting, uh, colored lighting and the, the fans like visible. It was still this sort of invisibilizing the relationship between her movement and what the technology could do. And just really quickly, Loie Fuller is a choreographer who was working in France in the 18... You can do now it. I'm, now you I'm can gonna, do it. <laughs> oh, I've been in my contemporary world for too long now. A long uh, time ago, about a yeah. hundred years ago. But she was working on kind of lighting effects as um, early iterations of a kind of technical presence in dance and sort of pre, 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 pre digital. But she's important to us in so many ways. I mean, she's lesbian, white woman lesbian, moved to France, had her her you know partners, but also her acolytes. But she also um, earned patents for some of her designs and creations. So she is an engineer herself, and she's an artist, and she's queer. So she brings these these areas together, and that's part of how she comes into existence as herself. So I think she's you know a, a, a super interesting figure. Um, but she wasn't making this sort of causality present. And I'm wondering if this question that we're asking where you're, you know, you see the causality that a gesture produces a thing, um, there's something about that, that that puts the dancer into the interface and the machine, like, oh, the dancer is lively, but they're also part of the machine. And there's a kind of satisfaction of seeing that. But um, now that it's so available in video games and all kinds of interactive design, I wonder if that's part of how it's less you know, effective in a way because it's quite ubiquitous. You go to the bathroom and move your hand and the paper towel comes. So, you know, seeing that sort of turn into a stage gesture, um, you know, maybe is less, less powerful or sort of novel in a way. Um, but with dance tech works and interface work, there's always this question of causality and whether it really matters if the performer does the thing or not, or is the, the you know, is the, the ghost behind doing the thing that's happening anyway. Um, so, you know, we're designing these interfaces and working on them and seeing what they can do. Um, but um, at the same time, working in the lab space means that we're not creating products. So there's a point that we get to where we've exhausted our interest and the sort of robustness of the design, and then we move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if that's part of it too, is that this working in the lab means working on a thing, but not necessarily producing the product that gets patented. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and I think it relates back to, to what you're talking about in terms of uh, different temporalities mm. and pushing against the temporality of the lab mm. from an artistic place, but yeah. then also you're doing so specifically from a place of critical black inquiry. Well, this is a really huge one, what you just said, and we had never said that to each other. Like, the lab wants to go on as long as the lab wants to go on. And some of my electrical engineering colleagues who I work with, you know, in my current institution, 
they run experiments that fail, you know, for five years in a row or, you know, seven years without a big grant. And, you know, for engineers, a big grant, of course, is a half a million dollars, but that means they're getting, you know, 75000 every year to keep their labs going, to keep their research going. So it's kind of a side gig or a side hustle when they come work with the artists in the slippage lab or, or other labs. But at the same time, we have deadlines and performances and we schedule projects. So we are on different kind of timelines in terms of um, experimentation and, you know, in a way, productivity. So, so that gets in there. And then we're talking about black time, too, which is, you know, a different way of thinking about how long something will take or, or how long um, we can linger inside of it mm -hmm. to understand what it could do. Ashley's perpetual problem over her whiteness. <laughs> Won't shut up. Um, <laughs> let's call it out right now. Um, <clears throat> no, thank you for that. I mean, because I think another thing that we were talking about a ton today was then the move outside of the lab. So, you know, there's a way, if we're going to stay tilted towards black life, thank goodness, finally we're doing this, you know, so... Black life and black creativity is bound up with stylization. So style is super important. So we have ways that, you know, communities of black people uh, gather around reanimating technologies, using them differently, using a phone differently, using a camera differently than, you know, es essentially how it was designed to be used. Like what else could it do? And let's stylize our relationship to technology. So... Um, these performances uh, do move way outside of the lab and outside of the theater space or the museum gallery um, into the nightclub, into and many of the places that I was listening before, into the basketball game, into the football stadium. So um, maybe another way to think about it is how um, dance technology or inter interactive performance is actually distributed across kids' birthday parties or um, liturgical dancing and churches, uh, you know, it, it just comes out in different forms in different places than thinking it needs to be in a theater, you know, at Impact or at BAM or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's where we meet the Let Him Move You series too, which we'll see a little bit of on Thursday. But this is a project that kind of is has an iteration in the theater and as well in the nightclub and on the street and kind of moves between these spaces as opposed to choosing one of them. Um, and I'm really excited to start to see a little bit about how that, yes, we are, like you said, we are at MPAC this week. <laughs> um, and so what is the weight of this building and the kind of technical infrastructures of it place on the work and and how does it also liberate it like I'm just curious about some of these in a way we're very much in a lab here as well um, and with a lot of very specific media um, that are extraordinarily culturally um, grounded in various different ways and so there are these like different iterations then of the lab and of where dance technology might find its home or its um, I don't know yeah, I'm with you. I mean, I'm just thinking about how the logic of the institution creates a time. You know, it creates its own logic of time. And, you know, you pay attention, you go to see the performance, and there's a, you know, there's an assumption that you're going to watch it. But, you know, when you're dancing in the nightclub or you're playing a game at home, you're playing on the Xbox, um, you can turn your attention away. You can, you know, again, sit in a moment or sit in a beat. Um, or repeat it and wind it back again or wind it forward, do it super fast. So there, there is a way that the, the theatrical-based performance um, brings a lot of constraints with it uh, in terms of time and how time operates and expectations of time and gravity of time. And, you know, you know the idea, you know, one thing about improvisation and, and these interfaces we create are always um, for improvisation. So in the Kane project, the choreography was created through improvisation, but then quite codified. In the other pieces, it is improvised. Mm -hmm. So the relationship to the interface is improvised. Um, and improvisation is so important to black life because it's like it, it, there's, a, it, there's a kind of way that black life, where we want something holier than black death, yeah. 
something holier than Black Death. Um, Tomorrow's Not Promised. That's kind of standard. Everyone can say, oh, we have a version of Tomorrow's Not Promised. For black people in the context of the, certain, the specific um, political moment we're in now and the social state we still live in, that's real, real. Tomorrow's Not Promised. So how time is manipulated and the kind of gravity of needing to pay attention becomes um, really contentious uh, in different kind of cultural formations. And it, it feels to me, and this is more of a question, okay. but um, somehow it feels like technology, I, mm. I don't know, I'm throwing that, you know, um, is like at the center of that in a lot of work that I'm seeing right now, um, no matter where it is, if it's in the lab, if it's in the theater, if it's on the street, whether it's a cell phone or, um, you know, I was really noticing the staging of the three pieces that you showed, and there's a clear choice to show the interface, which feels very retro, Tommy. <laughs> um, and, you know, like to put the camera on the stage and to have the, you know, we, we feel that, we see that interface there. Um, and so, but then I ask myself why it feels retro to me. And if maybe if in this uh, turn toward a critical black dance studies that you're talking about, um, there is like, I don't know, for some reason, I'm just sensing that in a lot of um, younger, even emerging black choreographers that I'm seeing work right now, to me, technology just has a, a central force in the work. Um, it seems to be pushing it, and that can take its shape in various ways, like I said. Mm -hmm. But I wonder what the connection there is, if if technology in this way, or mediation, or um, you know, a kind of global networking, or something like that, is is critical to the black dance studies that you're talking about, mm -hmm. or if that's just something I'm placing on it because that's what I look for in work. Yeah, you know, that's hard to say. I mean. It, it's definitely, I think it's definitely, you know, that I think, of course, I think it's definitely critical. It's, it's front and center and it's right there. But there's this way that Afro pessimism says you let it all out, you show it all. So I keep thinking of um, um, AJ, Arthur Jaffa's um, Love is the Message, the Message is Death, which is, a, I think, a, an eight minute film that's just an amazing sort of compilation of. Oh, it's even hard to describe it, what it is. And if you haven't had a chance to see it, it's still on tour, I think. But, it, you know, you'll find sort of references to it. And if you dig, you dig towards dark web, you can find a version of it online. Um, it's an incredible sort of compilation of, of stuff that's gathered through media. You know, so cell phones, handphones, actual cameras, uh, sometimes actual organized media, but mostly sort of... Um, um, you know, the, the kind of accounts that come um, when black people are, are uh, in, in the line of sight of black subjection or disavowal or pol police brutality is another way to say that. Mm -hmm. Like when we're seeing that and capturing on the cell phone, mm -hmm. like all of these fragments, um, which are not performances, but become performative. And Arthur Jaffa mobilizes them into this thing that's almost unwatchable. I mean, I think for me, that's like, one of the most unwatchable pieces of, of creativity in the last five years. Um, it, it's just really hard to take. But again, it, it kind of, it, it reminds us of the centering of technology in, in black life. And then, you know, technology here is surveillance. It's an opening outward towards a networking, which sounds quite positive, but it's also a kind of surveillance that underscores the fugitivity yet again. Like it puts us again in line with capital and again in line with um, um, abjection and subject being subjugated um, because we're not necessarily writing the code or not, we're certainly not you know, owning the companies um, and imagine the companies as being helpful to the communities that are making so much use of the technology. So you know, I think those, those um, miasmas, those gaps and openings are, are really important to think about. But the, the fact of the technology in these dance performances is like the fact of water or air. Yeah, yeah. I actually wonder if that's not where we want to open it up a little bit. 
um, to questions or more dialogue or I know that also this conversation is kind of particular to a dance field. Um, so I, another question that I have is how it is specific to this one way of working or how it's not, um, follow that last thing just that uh, you know what you and I are talking about is is super dance specific like I think the conversation that we're having is very much rooted in the field of dance and so I just to acknowledge that and oh, okay. and wonder a little bit how much what we're talking about might relate elsewhere and how much it actually it doesn't and that it is a very much a disciplinary conversation Maybe that answers my question. <laughs> yeah. 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 There's some listening devices that are embedded in those cane stalks, which are the, the casings for um, um, fluorescent light bulbs. That's what the stalks are made of. And you know, so there's some listening happening in the stalks. And um, there's a, 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 a kind of machine learning that's going on where um, certain sound files are, are animated according to what, the, what it hears and distributed out. And, you know, so it has literally sort of the interactive sort of step produces sound at certain points in the in the performance. But we, you know, we worked with wearables uh, this year. The the synth ball, which is a, a, a handheld device, um, and it basically has a photon inside of it. So photons, the the newest versions of Arduino's now have Wi-Fi, and they're called photons. They're super fun because you, because you can code on the fly without it actually being connected necessarily to um, some sort of device where you can download the code. You can re you can sort of reset your parameters as you're working with it, so that's a great thing. And the photon has that, and the photons are pretty small and light. So then we went back to we had done some wearable technology work and then abandoned that because it's clunky. It's not very danceable. Those devices weren't, but the photons are super light. So now we started this year with some more photon device projects to see where those are going to go. So. Interface, you know, for me, is anything that's that's offering a kind of back and forth of data between performer and machine, if you will. And I guess I will say what's what's different, that kind of gets into what I'm trying to articulate is this maybe like lab, not lab yeah. dichotomy that I set up. But but really what I'm trying to say, right, is a lot of these technologies that you're talking about are, are used specifically within this artistic context that within... Uh, I feel like there's less cultural specificity to them when you throw them on the stage in front of an audience. Like you have to build that context. Whereas when you introduce an object like a cell phone, to me it feels a little bit more like it's coming with a cultural signification that we live with and sleep with. And um, and so I also wonder about that difference. Like to me, maybe that's why this, um, this kind of interactivity with these interfaces is feeling less grounded in mm. a political and, and um, discursive moment. But that's the thing, like that, that, that kind of gets at an assumption that you could separate them. Mm -hmm. You know, for us, we're black people. And so for us, it's like, well, of course it's grounded in political um, and aesthetic sort of assumptioning mm -hmm. that's around subjection, disavowal. So, you know, maybe that's useful because it's like, <laughs> The idea that you could somehow do something that didn't have anything to do with your blackness mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. like, why would you do that? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, the 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 poss the opportunity of being an artist is to offer stuff out to people, mm -hmm. um, you know, rather than kind of pretend it's not visible or present or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah. So that's super interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea that you could make something with a a, a, a small robot and suddenly it wouldn't have um, political sort of valence, mm -hmm. like it wouldn't sort of represent for capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, but in this this sort of intentional rendering, it's like, well, no, we're curious about how it represents certain kinds of blacknesses, mm -hmm. not one thing, but many things, and then which ones, when, and how, and what do we want to kind of animate and mobilize. But yeah, maybe it's that. I mean, there's something that's kind of like um, intersectional feminism. It's It's intentional. So there's a, a, a stylization that's intentional rather than allowing the object to kind of just sit there and as if it could be nothing. Mm -hmm. 
you know. Yeah, that's super helpful. And I think that's really different actually from how this work was originally introduced mm. into the landscape. Yeah, but that's, you know, that's kind of just white privilege and white supremacy where you mm -hmm. think you can be universal because you are. Yeah. Like, oh, I am, so I get to say. And, yeah. um, you know, th there's a lot of that inside of, of, of interface, of algorithmic design and inside of, you know, kind of how we actually are able to manipulate a cell phone. Well, someone had to go, you know, I'm just going to say it goes like this. You know, right. this date is me. They taught yeah. same way. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we bring these questions to bear... Um, and maybe this is something that's super important about POC, uh, people of color making work now, experimental performance now, is that we're able to be aligned with the, the, the political um, possibility and the urgency of being politically intentional, mm -hmm. or at least the affordance of it. What happens when you are intentional mm -hmm. to, to kind of um, engage queer identities, queer black identity, like what can be produced through uh, a kind of intentional, non-binary, you know, gender sort of exploration. What happens? Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that is different than kind of modernist abstraction. I think that modernism yeah. is the thing we gave up on a long time ago, thank goodness, yeah. um, even though like MoMA keeps trying to resurrect it and bring it back. And it's <laughs> like, well, we finished with that. Asked and answered, it didn't work because mm -hmm. it was too vague. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No? Yeah, no, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm, yeah. I, I, yeah, and I guess I think what you're bringing up about the white supremacy that's embedded in it, I, maybe that's what I meant, actually. Just, like, acknowledging that, like anything else, that this is the place where that field, this field started. It feels like this field of dance and technology in particular. Um, and, and that maybe actually what I'm desiring to happen is just for calling that out more mm -hmm. or something or complicating it more. Or I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's it's challenging though. The you know the responsibility for Black people has always been to do the work <laughs> on behalf of everyone right, else, right, right. and then we're again in a field where it seems as though in this project that Dante and Juma and company are doing, you know, the technology plays a central role to kind of revise what could happen. So again, here come the people of color to do the work mm -hmm. to reinvigorate the the sort of corpse with liveliness and and excitement. Um, you know, so we want to be kind of attentive to that. It doesn't mean it shouldn't happen. I'm not saying that, but no. to be attentive of it yeah. is to understand mm -hmm. how the code is dripping in front mm -hmm. of our eyes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Just two thoughts. So I could never handle the term dance technology, which I never understood, because I always thought, well, it's either dance with technology or technology used in dance, and it could be a light, as you pointed out. And today we understand usually when we hear dance technology, digital technology somehow. So ju that's just a comment that actually for the first time I understood the term dance technology through your talk mm -hmm. in a different way, which leads me to my second thought that I've observed that digital technology used in artistic ways by white people has very often an alibi function and promotes technology as the new gain paradise or see how creative we can be with that technology. And the thought just crossed my mind watching the examples and listening to you that the use of dance technology or technology in black dance, so not black dance studies, but mm -hmm. black dance, actually, as I say it as a white person, can resist the alibi function much easier, or to put it in a, in a more direct way, that cannot be used as an alibi function for, let's say, Silicon Valley or development of technology because it is situated in a different cultural context where the, where the tension between where the technology comes from and who is applying it, using it, creates already maybe a 
positive tension which simply is inherent to how you use the technology as opposed to me doing another EAT project and seeing how great technology is in the arts. Yeah, thanks for that. That's super helpful. I mean, I was thinking about how, you know, black culture, and there's, there's a lot of uh, kind of um, presumptive uh, gathering in this language of black dance or black culture. And, and you know, that's why I kind of giggle or chuckle a little bit when I say it, because I want us to all recognize that we're talking about cultures. It's quite plural. And it's not one thing. It's not a unified subject. But there's this way, though, that if we're going to allow it to be unified for a minute, I mean, black people believe in dance. And it seemed like modernism started saying, or after modernism, like, well, maybe dance doesn't matter. Then we have conceptual choreography. Um, and technology, in a way, I'm, I'm taking a different strand to respond to what you're saying. Um, you know, maybe technology projects or projects, as you were saying, um, that were apolitical, stop being interested in dancing as an activity. Um, but what's interesting about black experimental dance, I think, and black experimental performance is it's still quite concerned with what the body can do because there's an assumption, a grounding assumption, that we don't know what a body can do. So the dancing helps sort of animate this liveliness. Um, and it's a, cult, it's a space where um, I think there's a real bifurcation. So black performances tend to really have dancing and value dancing and think dancing is valuable and, and useful in the, the creation of an experimental sort of encounter. Um, whereas um, artists from other sort of traditions or curious about other kinds of questions with technology would maybe not be interested in, in, in actually moving in a particular kind of way. So that's something else I'm curious about. I don't know if you um, agree with that or think about that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, my first in instinct was to disagree mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, but I see the, I think what it relates to is the definition of what dance is sure. there, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think the way that you're talking about it here, like really, yeah, there's like dancey dancing. Like we really saw yeah. like some dancing yeah. right. in there. Um, and I think that what's interesting is that what where I would disagree mm -hmm. is that uh, the movement of the body as like an essentialized mm -hmm. thing is very central to this like dance tech. And I'm using it really as a, like a discipline that ended up getting codified, right? Like a, a, a field, it's become a field that people talk about. Um, but I agree with you, Johannes, also in your critique of that. But, but yeah, I think there is ultimately an across the board within that field an essentializing of the moving body and its movement as like fluid and, um, sexualized and uh, objectified in a really strong way. So that's that's the part of it that I would push back on there. Um, but then I think you're right that within a dance vernacular, right. yeah, I see what you're talking about, absolutely. Uh, what role do you see the audience in this uh, improvisational interface? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, it kind of goes back to, I think, why you keep asking this question, because the audience's participation in the earlier experiments, if you will, was to kind of witness. It's a little bit like what the last comment was. It's, uh, half of it was probably to just witness the wonder of this, you know, like, oh, they can do that. That's amazing. Um, and then the other half was maybe to, to kind of, um, um, I don't know, half or half, but um, to... to, to to, to, to validate the, the kind of expansion towards uh, tech or algorithm, um, to kind of um, build out from that. Um, what's happened in the last, I'd say more recently, is that it's less interesting because people, again, this is back to this idea that it's ubiquitous. So if you have money and resources and a television in a room, you have an Xbox or Connect, you know, the Connect, or you have some other Wiimote or something, so that that it's not so amazing that these experiments happen, or maybe you're doing your final, it's not Final Cut Pro anymore, but you're doing whatever kind of video editing in high school or even middle school, so then seeing the kind of um, um, processed image on a stage, uh, you know, that's not maybe so interesting. But live performance still does offer us this chance to assemble, and I think that's part of the role, and that's, that's a thing that hasn't gone away yet, and, um, matters 
um, that, that, that the audience decides to be an audience, as Randy Martin, you know, the theorist, defined it. So the audience has to figure out how to live in its diversity together. Um, you know, how do you assemble and decide you're gonna be an audience? Um, so that's one role, is to do the work of the audience, which is to figure out how to be together. too far afield, but in jazz, yeah. and there's a solo in jazz, yeah. the audience will give the yeah. performer a, a significant uh, push. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and these, these, these um, interfaces, I mean, one would hope in the Kerr Walker piece, it kind of depends on, so exa for example, the first piece that we looked at, you know, it's this kind of story of different audiences respond differently, which is a little trite and reductive and still quite true. So, you know, when there are a, a lot of people who are kind of responding to the theater of black death and the sound of a riot and the sound of the Negro national anthem and this layering of image, then there's audible sounds among the audience to kind of consecrate the exchange is the way I would put it. Um, but that might not be true for other audiences who are used to kind of accepting and then responding at the end and then talking about it later you know, or not. So, you know, I think that kind of basic thing you're asking about still happens according to audience sort of preparation. Like, what's your responsibility in an audience? And if you know you're jazz, if you go to jazz, you know you're supposed to. Like, that's part of what it is. You're, you're part of the performance, hopefully. Okay, thank you. Any more questions or final thoughts? Is there one more over there? No? Um, thanks. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on some technical decisions that were uh, motivated by some of your cultural concerns, or political concerns. Yeah, that's a great question. The slippage what we, we've done since we sort of made a thing is say that the, yes, let the punishment suit the crime, but also let the, the design of the interface follow the, the, pro, the path of the project. So, you know, the, for example, the Kane project, we started with what we wanted to do in terms of storytelling. We kind of worked through that. Like, is it literal? Like, are people really dressed like they're in the 1920s? And those kinds of decisions came along the way. And we knew that there was probably going to be a Kane field. And then the idea that the Kane field needed to respond somehow to the performance. Because the question was, how do the places hold history? So how does a place hold the history of a, you know, a people, um, how does it remember? So then the, de the design and, and technical decisions come after the establishment of this is what we're trying to do. And another example that you didn't get to see, but the synth ball was about a kind of um, object that represents a, a, a noise in the back of the head that, you know, if, if you're misseen in public, you know, as a person of color, and someone missees you and thinks you're someone else, something really bad can happen. So it's like a, it's like the buzz that this building doesn't have. And that's one of the reasons the building seems so foreign to me. I'm like, where's the buzz? Because the buzz is always there. You know, I could fail in this encounter with you, who I don't know, because you have power in a certain way that the society says you have. So then that object was to try to materialize the buzz. Like, how can we make the buzz both palpable and present? And then it needs to be portable. It needs to go into the audience. So, you know, that's quite one-to-one. -one, but here are the questions. Here are the things we're working on. How can we design an interface or an object that actually answers that thing? So we, you know, definitely work in that manner. And the projects get as far as they get. And um, this thing about the, the scheduling, like, how long do you have before you have to move on to something else? Or the performance has to happen and then you know, the object, the, the interface has to be as good as it can be, and then it's time to do the next thing. So this kind of um, narrowing of time through um, performance that, as in let him move you, there's a date and time when people are gonna assemble and be an audience, so something should happen at that moment. But at the same time, I mean, we were talking about the complexity of that earlier today in terms of, you know, a couple of the pieces that you, yeah. or at least one of them that you showed today, you said it's still, we're still working on oh, it, yeah, right? Sure. And same here, I mean, there have been many iterations of, we were talking about how either, um, you know, 
via these street performances or club pops up, pop-ups in any residency, there are iterations of public performance of the piece. And so there is a life before that moment. And I imagine that there's always a life after it. And that's the other thing uh, that's very particular about, well, it's not actually particular at all, but it's mm -hmm. specific to this type of engagement and, and body performance. And I think the way that uh, artists are working right now is um, that it very much starts early, finds itself in many different iterations across a path, might have a moment of a premiere or something like that, but ultimately the, that's really losing weight and meaning at the, at right now. Um, and so while yes, what you're saying is totally true, especially in, ter in the capital of performance, um, but that's part of what's being, I think, pushed against right now as different uh, value versions of performative events take place. And maybe that's a great place to end is like this idea that we can shift the terms of valuing how our encounter happens. Because the performance in a nightclub, you know, performance, the, the, the being alongside performance, you know, in the nightclub could really do something, um, you know, amazing. And then um, there's a different kind of, you know, maybe it's a more 21st century sort of um, valuing of the work of the artist and the, 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 the relationships that we make and are also political concerns that we're alongside each other and have to figure that out somehow, some way, someday. Thank you so much, Tommy, for indulging us <laughs> and sharing. And